Hello, welcome to Austin Bros. And this week we're talking about beer labels. So obviously when we talk about beer labels, there's always a lot of debates going around it. And I found myself last week on Twitter looking at some copyright infringement about beer labels located in our region. I won't state any brands or any name in this video except for the bigger brands that do copyright infringement, but it's not going to be beer related. Before diving in those three annoying things about beer labels, I want to point out the fresh new merch that we have. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, the link is down there in the description. Go visit the website, buy a t-shirt, buy a sweatshirt, a tank, whatever you'd like. Wear it proudly and support the show. All the proceeds go to further projects that we have on the go with Ops and Bros. So um, we'd really appreciate if you guys stop by. Thanks a lot in advance. So first off, what really, really pisses me off about beer labels, it's copyright infringement. Infringement? Infringement. In the last years, we saw a big explosion of milkshake IPAs or a lot of adjunct beers. Most of them were using, not most of them, a lot of them were using cereals, so branded cereals to push off that marketing favor towards their beer. So we're speaking of Fruit Loops, Pop-Tarts, and Lucky Charm. All those brands filed copyright claims towards the breweries using their brand or brand elements into their beer label. Of course, if you're brewing a beer with Fruit Loops, using a toucan and the colors and sometimes the typo, then you're probably hurting yourself more than anything else. But from what I've seen, breweries really benefited from that on the side of the media attention. If we look at Farnam, which did the Fruit Loop beer earlier this year, they gained so much free attention from the media with that milkshake IPAs brewed with Fruit Loop. We had Dominion City here in their area, which got a claim from Pop-Tart, again, another brand owned by Kellogg's. And I've heard about it, but I'm not sure if Lucky Charm did the move forward about Smart Mouth Brewery, the famous milkshake IPA they did with Lucky Charms. Sorry about the sweaty face. I just got back from the gym and back from the shower too and I'm just sweating the hell. It's so humid for September here in the region. It's crazy. I have to keep up with that, doing the edits and doing the recording. I'm in my basement and it's like, I'm all sticky. It's, it's not fun at all. But also there's been instance of brewing copying other breweries label. Of course, what happens usually it's a mistake it's only inspiration but it does not look good on social media when it happens usually there's always a little bit of fighting involved and it's not what you want when you want to push a new brand forward and of course if you are in the same region as the brewery it tends to look very bad with all the breweries popping up here and then designers have a challenge to create something that's unique but also reflect the brand that they're working for doing their research doing the research in the region when they do a style if they base themselves on another brewery style of label then you shoot yourself in the foot you don't expect the right thing for your brand and the design doesn't reflect what you want in the end process so my second point it's transparency. I think it's something that's very recurrent on the channel. I always talk a lot about that because it's deep in my heart. Transparency is an important fact when you're a brewery. And sometimes the label doesn't reflect really what transparency or doesn't really inspire me in transparency. What do I mean by that? A lot of contract breweries don't state where they are brewed. They just put the name of the brewery, that's the ones that they did the beer or whatever. And I don't like that. As an example, brands that are using Ashlag Brewery out there in Montreal always state that it's brewed at Ashlag. But I've seen breweries in Ontario being contract that never stated where the beer was brewed. Again, it's part of the transparency. If you don't have a brick and mortar location and you brew it somewhere else, state it on your label. Basic thing. I know, but it's part of the transparency thing. And now for the adjunct part or the ingredient part. A lot of brands do put out, let's say, milkshake IPA or IPA, 
and they don't clearly state what ingredients are found in the beer. Of course, it's up to everyone. I know that a lot of people might not want to state every single ingredient in their beer because of uh, not consistency problems, but more of the, they don't want to get their secret recipe stolen or whatever, but mostly it's part of a new law coming up in 2022 here in Canada. Every single beer or alcohol product using adjuncts will have to state clearly if adjuncts were used because of the allergy problem or allergy or whatever. So for styles like oyster stouts on milkshake IPA stating that you're using literally oysters or lactose in your beer is important. Not all consumers know that a milkshake IPA is using lactose. So if you don't state it properly on your label, you might cause different problems to the consumer itself and hence the fact that you might not even go back to craft beer because of that. I'm saying this because I've read a comment on our Oyster 101 that we did a couple of months ago about someone that drank some Oyster Stouts without knowing about it and being sick the days after it. Missing work, but also got him very, very far of Stouts for a while because of that. And then turn, but not least, sexist or poor humor labeling. We always oppose ourselves against sexist labels and crazy as it sound or as it may sound we're not in the 50s so the marketers back in the 50s were pushing but wiser and light beers with very sexist labels um, promoting their own products with those labels with that brand of a strong man um, drinking its beer but not for the women that's doing their dishes or whatever very constructing bad sexism images into their labels or, or into their marketing. We were talking about 1950s, but it's still something that's recurrent to this day. There's breweries using women, objectifying them into their beer labels to promote sexiness of their product instead of just bare originality into their beers. Again, there's no place for that in the beer industry. I won't dive into a lot of details about poor humor, but I guess you guys saw a bit of the drama around the um, nuclear team beer that happened in the United States. I didn't dive really deep into it because I didn't know the full story around it, but it's something that don't do poor jokes about uh, an historical event that affected a lot of people or just poor joke about race, sexism, and just <sighs> pee pee poo poo jokes. like. You're better than this. And of course, if you want to put a shit emoji on your label, go ahead, do it, but make it nice. I don't know. You're a brewer. It's an art form. Your label should reflect that art form at the same time. There's very, very good examples of label out there. There's very bad examples of label out there too. Let me know what are your favorite labels and what are your worst labels that you've seen lately. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this little video. I'll see you guys in the next, which is, I think it's Thursday. Otherwise, let me know what you'd like to see next and uh, cheers. I'm gonna get a cold shower again. Oh.